So good morning, everyone. A warm welcome to this Bioeconomy Cluster Builder webinar, focusing on innovations in metal biorecovery. My name is Kim Cameron. I'm one of the business, business engagement managers at the Industrial Biotechnology Innovation Centre, and I'm part of the team responsible for the delivery of the Bioeconomy Cluster Builder project. So before we um, move on to the main presentation today, I'm just going to run through some quick housekeeping points. Um, everyone's muted for the moment, and we'd ask you to remain muted throughout the webinar. If you have any questions uh, for either our speakers or for the BCB team, please pop these in the chat box and we'll, we'll um, address these as we go along. We've got a dedicated Q&A session later on, so we'll, we'll answer your questions then. And the webinar will be recorded and um, uh, link to the recording will be shared with participants and also on the Bioeconomy Cluster Builder website. And in a few moments, Dana will pop um, our equality, a link to our equality, diversity and inclusion survey into the um, chat box. If you could take a few moments to complete that, that would be really helpful. Thank you. So just to run through our agenda this morning, we'll be together for around two hours. In a few moments, I'll give an introduction to the Cluster Builder project. Then we'll have our main presentations from our guest speakers. And as I mentioned, then we'll have a Q&A session before we move into some breakout spaces. These are really quite informal, just a chance to um, make some connections and do a bit of networking. And then before we close, I'll tell you a bit about future um, cluster builder um, events. And as I say, we'll close around midday. So a quick introduction to the Bioeconomy Cluster Builder. Um, the project is a three-year collaboration, ERDF-funded collaboration between the Industrial Biotechnology Innovation Centre, Innovate UK KTN and Scottish Enterprise. And it was devised to support uh, the delivery of Scotland's National Plan for Industrial Biotechnology, which aims to grow the turnover of the sector to 1.2 billion by 2025. Joining us for the breakout sessions later will be my colleague Andrew Bowen, um, Dana Helt, Rajesh Mestri and Catherine Mort from Innovate UK KTN, and the five of us work closely on the delivery of the project. So the project has three core aims. Firstly, we raise awareness of the benefits and application of industrial biotechnology and its capacity to improve environmental performance, support our journey to net zero, and create value from waste and co-products. So since the project was launched, we've looked at applications of IB in areas like construction, textiles and chemical manufacturing and obviously today we're looking at its power to support um, metal biorecovery. We also draw on the network's knowledge and expertise of the three partner organisations to connect the right people and resources to support the development of new value chains across the bioeconomy. So that could be connecting a commercial challenge holder with an academic partner, helping with supply chain challenges or working with businesses to identify sources of funding and investment. I'd like to say if we can't solve a problem ourselves, we can hopefully find you someone in our network that can help you progress things. And lastly, we encourage the utilisation of Scotland's bio resources. So six key feedstocks were identified in the national plan as being key, uh, core to the development of Scotland's bioeconomy. And these are essentially the raw materials that biotechnology processes turn into useful products. So thinking about things like crop residues, municipal solid waste, whiskey crow products um, and food processing waste. IBIOIC, Zero Waste Scotland and Scottish Enterprise created a um, bioresource mapping tool. And the BCB team can, this, this tool uh, holds information about the location and quantities of these um, feedstocks. And the BCB team can create um, bespoke report, reports for anyone that's looking for this information. So how do we achieve all this? Um, we run targeted workshop and events like today's, so bringing together communities that might not normally engage with each other. We try to spread the message that um, biotechnology can provide solutions to many of our net zero challenges. We also deliver events um, covering more tangible um, support for, for businesses, so topics like investment, life cycle assessment and digital marketing. And you can find details about our future events and also recordings of our past events on our website. And I'll share details of that towards the end of the webinar, web, web address and our contact details. And to complement this, we um, directly support SMEs. So in the development of their new products and processes. So this could be through tools like the Innovate UK 
Katie and Innovation Canvas, or perhaps by pulling together focus groups of relevant stakeholders um, to help people progress their ideas or proposals. And really following on from this, we signpost to funding um, and um, investment from a broad range of sources, including the enterprise agencies, UKRI, Zero Waste Scotland, and indeed um, the Industrial Biotechnology Innovation Centre itself. Uh, so if you're interested in finding out about any of those, then please, please do get in touch. So that's a, a whistle stop tour of the project. If you'd like any more information, please do reach out. As I say, I'll share our contact details towards the end of, of today's webinar. Um, and so with that, I'd like to hand over to the first of today's speakers, Professor Jonathan Lloyd of the um, Professor of Geomicrobiology at the University of Manchester and co-director of the Elements of Bioremediation, Biomanufacture and Bioenergy Network. So John, let me just stop sharing for a moment and I'll hand over to you. Brilliant. Thank, thanks ever so much for, um, for that introduction. Uh, okay, so I, I've got 20 minutes and I'm going to... Um, try and cover two uh, areas today. Um, we've dealt with where I'm from and what I do. So uh, the first part is just five minutes or so on the, the funding landscape. Um, and in particular, I'd like to say a little bit about the, uh, the E3B NIB and, and how that might be able to support this area uh, or continue to support this area. Uh, and, and also some other um, sort of you know, future uh, initiatives that, that might be worth discussing. Uh, and then I'll spend about a quarter of an hour just going through our, our own work and interests in Manchester. So an introduction to the geomicrobiology um, work that we do, and I'll focus primarily on uh, metal reduction and recovery, making nanoparticles from a, a range of waste metals, uh, including iron, platinum group metals, copper, uh, and work we're starting to do now around rare earths and, and gold. So uh, to start off with the first half, these are slides that were provided to me by Nigel Robinson, colleague in Durham, who's the PI on the uh, E3B NIB. Many of you, I think, will be aware of the NIB, and I recognise some of the names from, from, from other events and, and from projects that we've been able to support. But basically, this is one of the BBSRC networks um, that is focusing, this, this one in, uh, in particular, on metals uh, in biotechnology. And it has a fairly broad remit uh, around the, the, the metals theme. Uh, and I'm very much involved with the environmental theme. Uh, and, and we have supported and championed as best we can uh, the biorecovery of metals and, with a circular economy focus. So we're in the second phase of this uh, NIB um, and, uh, and this metals area is very prominent in our plans uh, for, for phase two. Um, we've, we've run quite a few projects uh, looking at recovery of at-risk metals, uh, you know, particularly targeting net zero goals. And really the, the aim is to try to move um, projects up through the TRL levels, from very early TRL. So introducing uh, academics to companies and, and, uh, and, and helping move those projects through to, um, you know, gaining additional support. So we've, we've you know, we've, we've supported a, a quite a few projects in this area and I'll give you some examples later on. Uh, we've run workshops to try to build international relationships. We, we have uh, certainly through COVID uh, used um, web-based um, platforms to Give presentations, and we've had companies, some some of whom are represented on this uh, in this meeting, um, and uh, we've also helped build consortia wherever we can to to target um, research programs. For example, as an engineer in biology, one recently, and the NIP helped build a, a network to to target that for metal recovery. So there's three projects here. If you're interested, please. We'll look at the website and I'd encourage you to to join the NIB as well and then you'll get regular updates on activities and you'll be eligible for funding uh, from the NIB um, but you can see here there's there's projects with uh, you know, partners in York um, uh, BGS um, have, have, have also benefited targeting uh, metal recovery uh, using uh, microbial systems the York work and then this example has looked at plants so you know biotechnology in the broadest sense for, for targeting metals. Um, one of the companies we've worked with um, quite extensively within the NIB is, is Johnson Matty and again there are people um, from the company uh, in, in, the, uh, in the call today and we'll be having a talk later on uh, from one of the, the, the JM representatives. So again a broad range of projects supported to, to try to uh, build academic links with, with, with JM and we'll hear more about those um, later on so I won't, I won't dwell on those. Um, but certainly the metal recovery, particularly platinum group metals, is, is, is featured 
with work in that area. Uh, work around metalloenzymes. Uh, so this, this is work that's been led uh, out of Oxford. Um, so, you know, getting metals into proteins that require metals and making sure that's optimized, uh, including work on uh, methylation calculators that have been uh, that led from the NIP as well. So those are on, on those slides. And I think these slides will be shared later. So if you want to chase down some of these references, you'll be able to. So the summary for the, um, for the E3B uh, activities, you know, there's 69 proof of concept and, and business innovation vouchers already uh, given out from the, the network and there'll be uh, uh, another 10 up for grabs shortly and on, on red I, in red I've given some of the, the deadlines that will be coming up so there's a business innovation uh, voucher deadline uh, next month and there's open calls for grant planning workshops and the remaining proof of concept awards uh, and then a range of other um, activities with, with, with various funders uh, and companies uh, and there'll be the other thing at the bottom I've highlighted is a 2023 meeting to exemplify the importance of uh, industrial biotech for meeting net zero circular economy goals. And, and I'm, I'm very sure that this area will be featured for, for reasons that will become clearer as we go through the, the slides from all the presenters today. Uh, the last thing I'd mention is that, you know, the BBSRC is very much behind this area. Um, so the, the, the NIB's been talking to BBSRC for a while about some of the areas that could be supported and, and uh, BBSRC were very receptive towards this and, and championed this to, to uh, build up a program of research that was opened up um, earlier this year. So there was 5 million uh, made available uh, and, and approximately half of that um, would, would go to metals. Uh, for you know bio recovery work primarily uh, and then another half for sort of textile processing and this is all in the sort of circular economy area uh, and I, I know many people on this uh, on this call would have applied for that and I think quite a few people would be waiting for news on that and I think there were quite a lot of applications so there's clearly a lot of interest in this area and my feeling is that if those projects are successful then there'll be further opportunities to to extend uh, and chase funding in, in, in the area from those initial projects. So that's all, that's all very good news. So that was my quick blast through the funding landscape and, and E3B and how that might help. And again, I just encourage you to, if you're not members of the network, please join it, have a look at some of the case studies and see if there's any of the activities that could help uh, drive your interests forward. So a little bit now on the work that we do. So I, I'm a Geomicrobiologist, I'm really a microbiologist who works in a, a geology department uh, effectively and I've been there for 20 years in Manchester. I focus on microbes that live in the subsurface, uh, organisms that uh, can't respire using oxygen in anaerobic environments so they respire using metals as electron acceptors, they're metal reducing bacteria. I'm interested in the physiology and ecology of those organisms, what they do to metals, um, how that impacts on the environment and how you can use those processes uh, in the context of this um, this session today to recover metals. And the, the main organism we work with or groups of organisms that we work with are metal reducers, iron reducers primarily. That would be the dominant electron acceptor in most environments where metals are respired. And these organisms break down organics liberate electrons which are passed onto the metals, in this case an iron oxide coating on a sand grain. They reduce the iron to give you Fe2 bearing minerals and there's an impact on other metals in, the, uh, uh, in that system as well. And you can fit organics in as both electron donors and alternative electron acceptors uh, in this model so uh, they can impact on the remediation and capture of metals but they can also break down organics as well in the process. Now, for this presentation, the key point here is that a, a lot of the reduced mineral phases are very useful, potentially useful for industry. So if you look at iron reduction on the top right, you're reducing very fine grain uh, particles like ferrihydrite, uh, very amorphous gel-like flocks to uh, a material that's much denser and, and, and and can be recovered magnetically, that's magnetite. And that has some very interesting catalytic properties which we've explored through a range of projects with a range of stakeholders over the years. And I'll talk a bit about that work um, in, in a few slides time. Um, now, if you take away the iron, 
these organisms can also reduce metals, um, including platinum group metals and precious metals. So uh, gold or, or palladium on this slide, top left, to make nanoparticulate uh, nanoparticle metal clusters that, that uh, have catalytic uh, activities. So that's something else we're very interested in. If you're interested in um, optical uh, qualities and quantum dot materials, you can do similar things with selenides. So you can reduce selenium oxyanions to elemental selenium and then down to selenide, react those with the metals to, to make again fine grain nanomaterials with very, very interesting light emitting properties and quantum dot materials. So I, I'm not going to go into those today, but they are uh, you know very valuable commodities as well. And we, we won't touch on the silver story at the bottom here. So Let's just go through a few examples. If we look at iron reduction, the sort of systems we look at, you, you would grow an organism, one of our model organisms is Geobacter. We also work with an organism called Schuonella, both able to respire a broad range of metals, including iron. You grow them up, add them to um, a suspension of ferrihydrite. We add an electron donor and an electron shuttle. It could be something like a small amount of humic material uh, or a flavin, uh, riboflavin again a, a, a cheap product uh, and then that will increase the rate of electron transfer from the organisms to the mineral uh, and then the mineral will become reduced uh, and you will end up with the formation of in this example magnetite very very fine grain um, strongly magnetic materials with, with interesting catalytic properties so we've, we've looked at lots of applications potential applications for this material Obviously, with our interest in metals in the environment, we, we've worked very early on using these materials to remediate uh, toxic metals in the environment. This was focusing on chromite uh, contamination in Glasgow in sediments. And the magnetite it has a very strong reducing potential. It, it, it's got Fe2 in the mineral structure, but also on the surface of the mineral. It's able to reduce chrome 6 to 3 and sequester that into the, uh, the mineral um, structure making it stable to reoxidation uh, and uh, capturing it in, in, in soils or sediments or reactors. Uh, works very well with chrome, also a broad range of other metals. Uh, you can also use the reducing power in this system to help uh, reduce organics, for example, nitrobenzene to aniline, um, chlorinated solvents to ethane. Uh, on the bottom right. And some of the kinetics for those reactions are very rapid, faster than just about any other system you'll find in the literature. Um, we, this is a little outdated now, but we, we, we have, in terms of catalysis, early on looked at using these materials to uh, upgrade heavy oils. And again, these work very, very well, turning a, you know, a very poor quality oil to a higher uh, quality uh, fuel. Um, obviously, that's something we, we don't do so much on these days. Uh, but it does illustrate the, the broad range of, of applications you can use these materials for. What, what I'd like to focus on a bit more, however, is, is how you can scale these things up you know, and, and, and deploy them. So obviously we tend to work in the very small volumes, you know, up to a litre or so in the laboratory. With the Centre for Process Innovation, we were able to very quickly scale these up. Um, so the, we ran these up to 50 litre bioreactors and, and these processes are scalable. A lot of people worry about these organisms being quite difficult to grow in specialists, but that's really not the case. So, so the, the scaling up of the organism is possible, and then you could at a larger scale, you could also do the mineral transformations. The, the critical point when you do the life cycle assessments is you've really got to do this from waste materials to make it competitive. So this was work we did with colleagues in Surrey and, and illustrated that, that um, that very very clearly so i think there is a, a very strong push to, to use these processes you know for a circular economy and to revalorize waste you wouldn't want to synthesize the starting materials in the laboratory and transform them so of course the obvious problem or question is can you use you know waste or uh, naturally occurring materials that are readily abundant this was work with a group in Czechos, uh, well, the Czech Republic, which showed you could use a, a range of uh, environmental sources of, of, these, uh, of these iron oxides uh, as a starting material. And that was published quite recently. So really, it, for the metal, particularly the iron area, we're in the, the, the revalorizing waste materials area now and the, the project we're, we're most involved with at the moment is looking at waste iron oxides that have been used to remove phosphate from groundwaters uh, and this is a, a european-led project an eu project 
uh, led out of Utrecht. And of course, this is a technology that's used extensively uh, in the Netherlands and but actually across Europe. So large quantities of waste iron oxides loaded with phosphate, and you can transform those microbially to a material called Vivianite, which you can then use as a, as, as a fertilizer, a slow release phosphate fertilizer that can help particularly where you've got um, high and limited soils. So that, that's quite an interesting project that's uh, in its final year now. Okay. So the, the other area that we're very interested in is adapting these processes to make higher value products. And here you wouldn't necessarily be tied to, to waste metals, but, but you obviously it'd be better if you could target them um, if possible. So I'll say a little bit about palladium now. That's a, a, a metal we've worked on now for a couple of decades. It can be reduced uh, from PD2 to PD0. Um, and then you can use that as a, a catalyst within cells alongside other biocatalysts. And, and this, so you've got multi-step transformations. And this is work we did with Nick Turner's group uh, in Manchester. So this is the, the bioreduction bit. This is this is we first published this back in 98 when I was working with Lynn McCaskey in Birmingham. So reduction of PD2 down to PD0. And if you're interested in the, the applications for, for the bioreduced palladium, there's a lovely review from one of our PhD students with, with Johnson Matty, uh, Chris Egan Morris. So please have a look at that uh, if you're interested in that area. But the work with Nick focused on bioreducing palladium within E. coli overexpressing an enzyme that Nick had, which is a, an engineered monoamine oxidase. And then that enzyme is able to selectively um, oxidize the top left substrate, the S form of MTQ, which is normally in a 50-50 a, a mix with um, its uh, chiral counterpart, the R form. And now the R one's the one you want, that's expensive. So you, you oxidize um, the, uh, the S, which is 50% of it to start with, and then you use PD in the cells to reduce that back, 50, 50 of it will go to the top, 50 of it will go to the bottom. So you're making 50% conversion to give you the R form. And if you do that multiple times, you will build up uh, the quantities of the, um, the form that you want, the R form, the high value one. So you get 98% excess within a few rounds. That's normally done in two pots, but you can do this in one pot if you preload the cells with palladium. So we thought that was really, you know, potentially useful. There's a range of sort of tandem catalyst type systems you could look at. We focused our attention next on copper for click chemistry applications. And this was a BBSRC funded uh, project. The first papers in this went out in 2018. Uh, and they were able to show that a metal reducer, Schuonella, uh, is able to reduce uh, copper two down to copper zero, make nanoparticles with a copper one shell. And that copper one shell is able to drive uh, click chemistry reactions, for example, these azide alkyne um, reactions to, to give you a, tri a triazole, which is a basic building block for a range of, of high value products. And that's what we're, we're still focusing on now. We're, we, we could do the copper bit. We're getting the enzymes together and we're trying to get these multi-step transformations running. Uh, and ideally, if you can do it from a waste source, fantastic. So we've had historic links in the past with Shivas to, to, to look at this and using waste copper from, uh, from some of their effluents to, to do these sorts of reactions. Um, when you start looking at waste metals, you've got to look at mixed metals. So we started to look at those a while ago. This was with Sarah Haig's microscopy group in Manchester. And uh, there's some lovely imaging in this paper here where we're able to look at the formation of these nanoparticles in hydrated cells uh, in, a, in a TM, uh, in environmental um, TMs. Uh, and then if you pull a vacuum on that system, you can get the very high level maps that you need. But this showed some nice composite materials um, with both uh, gold and palladium in. And then with Rick Kimber in the group and, and JM, we were able to look at some of the catalytic properties of these materials. And this was published last year. And particularly when you put silver in these systems, you get very, very uh, high rates. Um, so we we're exploring these mixed metals, particularly in the context of what you might get from, um, from real effluents in, in more detail now. Um, other metals, I mean, if we, you'll have seen this sort of slide many a time, I'm sure, before. This is the, the most recent version of the EU uh, analysis of critical metals. Uh, so on the left-hand side going up, you've got supply risk. Along the bottom, you've got economic importance. Uh, and if you, there's, there's a range of metals that, that feature in red that are important. This slide emphasizes that many of those are required for key technologies for the low carbon 
economy, so fuel cells, batteries, motors, wind turbines, etc. Uh, so that includes things like rare earths and as well as the obvious ones like cobalt and PGMs. Uh, and, and we started to, to look at those. Of course, the rare earths aren't redox active, so we need slightly different systems. So we're starting to uh, to engineer some of our organisms to improve that. Why are we doing this? Well, really, the recycling um, bar is pretty low on these. I mean, some of these are up at 25% can be recycled at the moment. Some of them are in single digits. And if we want to keep these very valuable resources out of landfills, we've got to target them. And we think biology can help with that. So we have a new project, EMRA, working on this. This is one of the engineering biology ones where with uh, colleagues in Durham uh, and, and, and uh, Quadrum over in Norwich, Martin Warren's group, we're looking at engineering these metal reducing organisms to target a broad range of metals and also have motifs that will grab the uh, the rare earths and compartmentalize them into bits of the cell that we're interested in so that we can start to sort the metals which is you know selectivity is a real driver for industry from from discussions we've had so that's with with johnson matty and uh, mint innovation who are very interested in gold recovery so I think I'm up to 20 minutes now. So I, I just have some conclusions in there that people don't think about geomicrobiology or subsurface microbes. It's quite an exotic location for many people, but it, it's actually a tremendous genetic resource for innovation. And you can use a lot of these organisms that are used to dealing with metals in those environments to revalorize waste streams. Um, the processes are eminently scalable and they can be genetically manipulated uh, and they could be used to support the circular economy. Um, but really, we've got to build stronger links, you know, with industry, engineering, got to look at the life cycle assessments really carefully to move us up through the TRL. So I'm delighted to be here at the meeting today and I hope this is the sort of event that could really, really help bring these, these, these areas uh, to the fore. So, uh, Kim, if, if, if that's OK, I think I've done 20 minutes now. So um... fantastic, John. Thanks. Thanks very much indeed. It was a great overview of the E3B network and also of, of the fantastic work that um, the geomicrobiology group are doing at Manchester. So, so thank you. So Thanks. I'll, if you're able to stop sharing, I'll hand over now to Lee Cassidy, lead scientist at SEM. And he's going to give us an overview of, um, of SEM and also consider some of the examples of their work in bioremediation and metal biorecovery. So Lee, I'll hand over to you. Fantastic, thank you. Am I on the right? Just need to go into presenter mode now, bottom. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, perfect. Morning, everyone. So I'm Lee Cassidy, and I'm the lead scientist at a relatively new SME up in Aberdeenshire. Um, we essentially are a circular economy company. So the main thing is that we see value in nutrients and elements that would normally be considered as waste. And we both uh, develop and uh, scale up technologies in order to facilitate the recovery of nutrients and elements. We work with a wide range of customers from a huge range of industries at the moment, the main focuses are agriculture, distilling, um, aquaculture, and ports and harbours. But we also do some other uh, niche technologies as well. So th the main core with us is that we believe that business needs to adopt a circular technology and a, a, actually a real genuine zero waste strategy, not just a carbon reduction, but actual reuse of everything that you can possibly reuse multiple times. We realize that that is a huge challenge for most companies and above all, try and do things practically. We want companies to actually participate and not feel as though they have to be forced into it, that they need to see genuine benefits from participating in programs like these and using technologies like these. What we've found is that there's very rarely a single solution, be it chemical, physical, or biological. Um, there needs to be a combination of technologies 
and as such, most of our most of our kit and um, things that we uh, put out on the site are modular. This means that each site can get a bespoke solution for their particular site, and they're not paying for parts of machinery that they wouldn't use. So essentially, by mediation, we tend to focus on in situ and as a part of a treatment train. So most of the treatments that we have are much larger parts of treatment trains. So the one I'm going to focus on today is one of our early technologies, which is DRAM. DRAM's essentially a modified waste product or co-product from the distilling industry, but it's not limited to just distillery solid waste being our raw material. We've done it with a wide range of other agricultural residues that can be uh, sourced reasonably easily worldwide. So we've looked at things that are suitable for, for example, the Middle East, where there are no distilleries, and things for uh, continents that are much further away, and it wouldn't be practicable to transport the dram from Scotland to the other side of the world. So because we're using what is essentially a co-product or a waste, it's relatively circular in the first place before we even start the treatment of, in the majority of cases for the dram, it's wastewater and effluents. So initially the dram, the mechanisms are physical. So just by the huge surface area, it traps and absorbs mainly the dissolved contaminants. There's a biologically active component which actually um, creates the right conditions for the chemical reactions for the absorption and absorption to occur. And the chemical parts in the matrix help the contaminants to bind. We started originally with chlorinated solvents, but since then we've discovered that we can do most metals, energetics, herbicides, BOD and COD under a lot of conditions. So now we'll go on to the stuff we've actually got in the field. So these are essentially case studies. So this is one of the very first drum jobs that we did. One of the largest ports in Scotland um, have a ship lift during which they take boats in um, multiple times a year. And as part of the maintenance, they actually strip the paint off the hull and the paint on the hull is full of copper, which is used as a biocide. Um, the wash water is then stored in a big tank and it is heavily contaminated with copper, which cannot then be released into the environment. So we managed to put in a small drum tank, which basically sits there with no control panel, no maintenance, it's simply black box in and then black box out again after three months. This site's now been in compliance and is regularly checked with SEPA for over eight years. So as part of that, um, so not only do we use biology at the front end in the operation of the filtration mechanism, we also have started to recover uh, the nanoparticles from the dram biologically and chemically. So this is work that was done really early on. This is actually from that uh, Port Authority site. This is real effluent, real waste filter media. And the group at Edinburgh University managed to recover nanoparticles from the spent drum. And that was way back in 2015, I think. So we, as I said, we could do a wide variety of metals. So we also do a couple of uh, galvanizers um, where the target metal in those cases is zinc. As yet, we have not started to try and re-recover uh, the zinc from these sites, but we have uh, made the client very happy, um, meaning that they no longer need to use their organic resins and the units in site have a very low maintenance schedule. So we've also entered a number of competitions with some of the technologies. We're always looking for new markets and new applications. 
So we were actually runners up in the Water Dragons competition, um, which again was looking to take zinc out of the water. But in this particular application, it was with um, a municipal wastewater treatment plants. So it's absolutely huge volumes. So um, in particular, the more urban wastewater treatment plants have problems with particularly zinc in their wastewaters, um, which mainly comes from road runoff. There's a lot of zinc is shed off tires and various other car components. And what that means is it goes through the treatment system and ends up in the biosolids. So one of the largest water treatment companies in the Midlands in England has found that they're basically unable to reuse the biosolids because they're so heavily contaminated with zinc. We worked in conjunction with Coventry University to develop a system where we combine our DRAM technology with their bioleaching technology in order to recover the zinc and the, the zinc from the biosolids, which would make them usable. But not only that, the biosolids themselves could be used and sold by the water company in order to generate further income and get rid of a waste stream that no longer needed to be uh, landfilled. We've also, I mean, whilst we normally do industrial effluents, we've also done some groundwater work as well, um, particularly in Glasgow. Glasgow has a bit of a history with chromium, uh, mainly as a result of the old White's Chemical Factory, which um, used to make matches. Chromium's a, a byproduct from the matchmaking process. And when the factory shut, I think probably way back in the 60s, um, they very kindly donated a lot of the rubble from their factory to create infill for building projects when they were putting up all the new tenements and multi-storey buildings. As a result of that, a lot of the groundwater in the Glasgow area has significant chromium contamination. We uh, put in a different type of installation there. So essentially what we did was we presented uh, the dram along the side of a, a, a stream, a small stream, um, contained in gabions. We originally guaranteed the installation to work for six months. Um, we always were quite convinced that it would only be a temporary solution. However, we've been pleasantly dis uh, surprised to discover that it's still working 10 years on down the line. So as part of the looking for new markets and new, new types of technology to work with, we recently did a project um, in a slightly different manner looking at waste electronics. So this was a project with the chemistry department at Edinburgh University. So essentially they use traditional chemical methods which involve quite nasty and harsh acids in order to solubilize the metals get them off the circuit boards, and then uh, recover the gold, and particularly the gold, just by precipitate of methods. What that means is they're left with um, quite toxic raffinate, which would essentially be a waste product and uh, make the, the use of the whole technology not particularly cost effective or desirable. So what we did in this case was use the drum at the back end of the process rather than at the start, which means we treated the raffinate so that it would be uh, completely benign and available for an environmental discharge. So as a result of that, I began to look into the, the mining process. And what I found was that um, mining should really be the most recyclable industry in the planet. We should be recycling nearly all metals. They're nearly all recyclable in some way, shape or form, rather than going down the route of further environmental degradation. There's problems with mining across the globe and a lot of the newer, rarer and more targeted metals are currently in uh, difficult geopolitical areas. This means that the less that we need to go abroad to get source these materials, and if we can recycle what we already have above ground, 
it's not only good for the environment, but it's also, also good socially and financially. So this is one of the this is the main project with the uh, chemistry department in Edinburgh. So these are just some of the images that we took through. So it was a very simple project. PCB boards were uh, chopped down, dissolved in acid. This gives you the raffinate. They separate the gold, precipitate it out, and then we take the raffinate, put it through the drum system, and this is the output. So very simple technology, nothing overly complicated. And as a further result of that, there was some publicity around that project, um, which was funded by IUBIOIC. And uh, one of the people that uh, administers the uh, Grand Management, sorry, the Grand Mining Challenge in the Amazon, which looks to help alleviate the damage caused by the artisanal gold mining sector. Um, they contacted us if we'd uh, like to apply for this. So out of 120 or so applicants, we were one of the 13 selected to go ahead and do the trial. This means that we're actually trialing the drum in, as a pilot project actually in the Peruvian Amazon. So this project's currently ongoing and this is the actual site that we're working on. It's, it's very remote. Um, so essentially the Madre de Dios area in particular Puerto Maldonado is a two hour flight into the jungle from Lima. And this is the nearest site to the town, which is actually another 90 minutes out with the town. So this is the actual miner. It's very rudimentary. They have essentially diggers. This equipment here on the left-hand picture is his mercury recovery. Um, he is one of the few that's actually licensed there. He's not an illegal mine. He is licensed and he does recover his mercury. But unfortunately, most of them don't recover the mercury, which means that it's actually ended up in the Madre de Dios River. It's now completely polluted the river, and the, as a result of that, the fish within the Madre de Dios are now inedible because of the mercury accumulation. So this is where we'll actually be working. I'm, I'm actually due to be over there in two weeks' time. And this is how rudimentary it is. So essentially the small boat pumps the gold rich sediment and liquid up here. It comes down a homemade wooden raffle bed where the gold's collected. And then in all the things are then surrounded by uh, tailings ponds which are contaminated with a, a variety of other metals. One of the good things about DRAM is its non-specificity. So essentially the filter media can mop up nearly all the metals at fairly high concentrations and sequester them quite tightly, which means we can then remove the filter media and take it to a different site for recovery of the metals. So whilst initially the miners in this location are only interested in gold, the way that we hope to engage them, because the environmental regulations are fairly poor and pretty much not enforced. Um, so what we plan to do is actually recover the metals, resell them back into the supply chain and give the miners themselves a royalty based on the amount of dram tanks they're using and filling with metal. I think that's me. Any questions? Thanks, Lee. We're, we're actually going to do the questions just at the very end once all the presentations okay. have gone through. Sure. So, so thanks very much for that. It was a, a really good sense of the wide range of customers that SEM serves and the, the amazing technologies that you employ to do that. And uh, I must say, I was when we first spoke about today's um, session, you weren't sure if you were going to be dialing in from the Amazon or not. So uh, I'm bet to be a bit disappointed that you didn't, but um, <laughs> it's, it's fascinating. Yeah, thanks again. It would have been three o'clock in the morning in exactly. the Amazon. <laughs> Yeah, that wouldn't be so handy. So, thanks very much. And um, we're going to move on to, now to Virginia Eshabari Barrow. Uh, Virginia has been a postdoc in Louise Horsfall's University of Edinburgh lab since 2015, working on several projects in the area of metal bioremediation, nanoparticle synthesis, and biomass valorization. So, I'll hand over to you now, Virginia, for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kim. 
So thank you very much for attending my presentation today. My name is Virginia, and I am a postdoc in Louis Horsman's lab. We are based at the University of Edinburgh, and today I will present in today the work, uh, the the work we are doing in the area of recycling metals contained in spent lithium-ion batteries using electric vehicles. We are part of the RELIP project that aims to. Uh, improve the recyclability close to 100% of the materials contained in the lithium ion batteries. And this project, together with others in the area of batteries and energy, is being funded by the Faraday Institution to support the electrification of the road transport. With uh, the replacement of petrol, petrol and diesel cars by uh, electric vehicles, the demand for batteries is going to increase, to increase hugely, up to 230 million vehicles by 2030. And with the increasing demand for batteries, there will be an increasing demand for the minerals used in the batteries. Some of these uh, minerals uh, are already critical, such as cobalt and lithium, and the estimated demand for these metals can be very variable, depending on the scenarios taken into account, but in all cases, the predicted demand is going to increase uh, above 400%. Also, the demand for nickel is going to increase hugely, and uh, abundance of nickel battery grade is not that high. So there is a wide range of uh, battery chemistries. Uh, lithium ion batteries doesn't contain only lithium. We can see that um, here, there, this is an example of the different cathode chemistries. Uh, different colors represent different metals. And so the, comp the composition between different chemistries can vary in terms of metal composition, but also in terms of the different proportions of each metal in the batteries, as an example in the MC battery types. Uh, lithium ion batteries uh, can be very variable in terms of chemistry, cathode chemistry, but also in terms of uh, shape, size, for example, we can find cylindrical, prismatic, and pouch uh, cell batteries that at the same time come in uh, modules that are part of, part of module packs. So the amount of uh, electric vehicles uh, increases on the roads, uh, the amount of spent lithium ion batteries uh, is expected to increase exponentially uh, from 2025 onwards. And this means that uh, the, the waste associated to these spent lithium ion batteries could pose uh, some environmental issues if we don't manage uh, these spent lithium ion batteries properly. The, currently, there are no global standards for the waste disposal of, leaf, of leaves. They contain uh, some toxic metals such as cobalt and nickel, also their toxic compounds such as the binders. So they can pose a, a problem for the human and environmental health. And also they can explode and cause fires. So recycling the lithium ion batteries is important to be able to unlock the metals contained in these batteries and minimize the risks in the supply chain for making new, new batteries. But as mentioned in the previous presentation, also to reduce the mining and smelting activities that have a negative impacts on human environmental health and also other ethical issues such as child labor. And also to make of this technology as a real alternative to petrol and diesel, we need to be able to develop sustainable recycling methods because currently the amounts of energy required to recycle these batteries and also the amount of hazardous compounds um, don't are not um, very sustainable. 
So uh, during the RELIP project, uh, different uh, challenges uh, uh, are being faced. One of the problems is that there, is little ex there was little experience uh, at recycling lithium ion batteries in the UK uh, due to the volumes and because uh, the batteries were sent to other countries uh, to be recycled, uh, usually using pyrolysis. Is a waste management uh, challenge because they, they can be hazardous. Also, due to the high diversity in terms of uh, cathode chemistry and shapes, um, so it's complex to uh, standardize and to automatize the, the process. So it's very important that during the recycling process, the value of the materials are preserved. And as I, and as I mentioned earlier, the development of greener, more sustainable uh, methods are needed. So uh, here in Edinburgh, as part of the uh, RELIP project, uh, we are developing biological methods to support the development of greener recycling methods. Uh, we've got experience in the area of metal bioremediation and metal biorecovery. Uh, we work with different bacterial species. Some of them are non-model organisms, such as uh, Morganella cyclotolerance that is able to produce silver and copper nanoparticles, and also the sulfobibrial ascensis that produces platinum palladium nanoparticles. So, uh, biological recycling methods exhibit, um, so follow the principles of green chemistry as reactions take place in aqueous solutions, low temperatures are needed, reactions take place below 20 degrees, and the addition of hazardous solvents are not needed. So uh, we use, we engineer this bacterium, this bacteria using th synthetic biology, biology tools to increase metal specificity, to increase yields, and to tailor the synthesis of these nanoparticles according to the end user's uh, requirements. So the work, uh, or the work of our, our group within the RELIP project is to investigate the selective separation of the metals uh, using bacteria. And we receive leachates, which are the metallic solutions that can be acidic or basic that are produced during the different um, steps of our recycling process and we incubate them with our bacteria and nanoparticles are synthesized. Examples here of nickel, cobalt, and manganese nanoparticles. And hopefully they can be useful to produce new active uh, battery material. So within a recycling diagram, what we do stays here. Uh, could be, it could complement chemical methods or even a, uh, replace uh, some of them uh, under certain circumstances, such as uh, chemical precipitation and uh, solvent exchange. And this is an example of, uh, here we've got, so here is uh, during the RELIP project, we are developing this uh, bacterial bioseparation step. And we are setting up the first steps and principles and um, what we are doing is we are uh, treating the leachates first with uh, Shiguanella onidensis that precipitates manganese selectively out of the um, uh, polymetallic solution when present, because not all the leachates will contain manganese. It depends on the uh, chemistry of the cathode. And here we've got examples of uh, in the so. I'll explain this diagram more slowly. So the raw leachate identified as T1A is treated with shiwanella, uh, manganese is precipitated, fraction is T1B, and then the metals that remain in the dissolved fraction are treated with a second bacterium, bisulfobibral ascensis, to precipitate cobalt and or nickel. Lithium remains in the dissolved fraction. So here uh, I present some of the results uh, we developed in a batch, uh, process. And this is the concentration of metals uh, in the leachate. 
and we can uh, see the cathode chemistry. So we can see that the composition of the metals in the leachate depends on the cathode chemistry, also depends on the solvent used to uh, dissolve the cathode. So T1B represents the amount of mangan, the amount the metals precipitated by Shiwanella. And the recovery is really good, above 90%. And T1C represents the metals that remain in the dissolved fraction that are treated by sulfovibrio. So here are different treatments, uh, different results of the treatment performed with sulfovibrio and the uh, uh, treated leachates with shiwanella. So we can see that the recovery of cobalt and nickel uh, can be very different depending on the treatment applied. I like that uh, these results have been performed in a batch process without any further optimization. What we have demonstrated is that first treatment can be scaled up. This is the 30 liter bioreactor we used uh, at the uh, flex bio uh, facilities uh, with iBio IC. And the manganese removal from synthetic model leachates was really good, above 96%. This uh, pilot experiment shows that the bioseparation of manganese could be performed at an industrial scale. Uh, at the beginning of next year, this uh, experiment will be repeated with real battery leachates with uh, optimized conditions. So right now we are working on the optimization of the process. We are engineering a bacteria, Shiwanella and Sulfovibrio, to increase metal recovery yields, also metal specificity, especially for the Sulfovibrio to separate a cobalt and nickel. And we are optimizing the process using bioreactors allow us to, to have a continuous control of the uh, process parameters to combine different leachate types to reuse uh, the water to regrow bacteria and minimize the water consumption and the waste uh, water produced and to increase uh, the volume of leachate treated per unit of time, the efficiency of the process, and hopefully to move towards a more continuous uh, recycling process. We are also using microfermenters to speed up the screening for the um, uh, most uh, useful strains uh, to, uh, for this bio process. And uh, so we, we can uh, test the performance of different strains under different conditions with different leachates that this can speed up the scale up process. So it's a take home message uh, uh, to, to tell you that we are working towards uh, the development of a more greener, more sustainable recycling methods uh, with the aid of uh, biology. The aim is not only to uh, selectively separate the metals contained in the battery leachates, but also to upcycle the, met the metals in the form of nanoparticles, which could add value to their recycling process, uh, produce new active cathode material, and also some of the nanoparticles produced as for example, the cobalt and nickel based nanoparticles could be useful as industrial catalysts. So we'd like to thank my group for their continuous support. Also a, spe a special thanks to other people in campus uh, who helped us uh, with the experiments and to our funding bodies that make this work uh, possible. And thanks to you for watching. Thanks very much, Virginia. That was a great overview of the Vila project and, and also just really underlining the kind of environmental challenges that lithium ion batteries present and, and the power of biotechnology to address those and also create value at the same time. So that was, that was fantastic. Thank you. So I'll hand over now to our last speaker, um, Kalani Karayalasam, biochemist at Johnson Matty at their Cambridge site. Kalani is going to outline Johnson Matty's biorecovery to a biorecover project and some of the metal biorecovery challenges that they have identified. So I'll hand over to you, Kalani. Thank you. Can you see this? No, I'm mute.
Am I muted? No, yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> Thank you. So first I will introduce you to the company and then talk about the BioRecover project. Is the slide not changing? Yep. So Johnson Mate is a strong and sustainable business founded in 1817 and built and build a global presence with significant operation in more than 30 countries. And in order to, to create sustainable technologies of the futures, uh, Johnson Mate innovate, create and develop uh, solutions to make the world cleaner and healthier with about 10% of dedicated scientists on R&D. As Johnson Mate's vision is for a world that is cleaner and healthier, uh, for today and future generation, Johnson Mate is using world-class science and technology to solve complex problems and enable the four key transition, which are the transition towards zero carbon transport, the transition to clean energy, the drive to decarbonize chemicals production, and the move towards embedding circularity. Of course, we can't develop the solution to the world sustainability challenges on our own. We need to work with our R&D networks to innovate and make the next technologies uh, that will impact the world and contribute to those four transition challenges that I just mentioned. So we work closely with uh, academia to stay at the cutting edge of uh, re new research in science and sponsor hundreds of uh, PhD students. It enables innovative science to be developed through early collaboration while sharing risk and working towards a common goal. Also, we partners with accelerators and incubators to investigate many different approaches to the complex problems that we are working to solve. So Johnson Mate wants to find solution in different areas, such as the platinum group metals field. And as you may already know, there is this uh, platinum group metal award scheme that enabled JM to give PGM salt to um, researchers doing inspiring science in these and other sustainable technology areas. So this PGM award scheme is open for application from any university or research institution globally. Application are reviewed every three months, and I think the next one will be in December. So by scanning this QR code, you will be redirected to the corresponding website if you want to apply. And of course, if you need more information, please send an email to the following email address. As PGMS has categorized as critical raw material, it's really important to recycle it. As John and Johnson Mate is the largest secondary refiner in the world with three refineries in Europe, USA, and Asia. JM developed highly advanced processes and for extracting and separating PGMS from project to a purity of 99.95%. The feed in, in take into our, our refineries are a mix of end life PGM uh, products and also process residues from spent catalyst to electronics and also jewelry scrap. This uh, refinery process is, uh, com is composed of four main stages. The first one is the smelting in which the material is melted for several hours at really high temperature. Then the chemical leaching that releases uh, the PGMS in solution. And then you have the chemical separation, which is a multi-stage uh, process, which um, give you at the end, the different uh, PGMS separated to each other. And then you have the chemical uh, synthesis in which the PGM are transformed into application ready product. With all the explanation I just gave you, um, you can see how stringent and energy consuming are the condition in the PGM refinery. So it's something that Johnson Mate would like to improve with better sustainable way to 
improve those conditions. So there is an opportunity and challenge to develop new solutions for PGM's recovery, like the BioRecover project. So the BioRecover project is uh, funded by Horizon 2020 program, and it involves 14 academic and ind industrial partners uh, from different fields. And it has a for objective to develop research and develop new sustainable process for raw, critical raw extraction uh, using innovative approaches based on biotechnology. The project is divided in three parts, which is the characterization and conditioning of raw material, then the recovery process of the critical raw material using biotechnology, and then finally the transformation of the critical raw material uh, in valuable project. Uh, Johnson Mate is involved in the three uh, big parts that I just present by supplying the raw material to the different partner. Uh, I work in the biorecovery process to recover PGM from uh, the way from uh, the after the bio leaching. And then finally, Johnson Malse also will uh, synthesize the final compound using uh, the critical material uh, after the recovery using biotechnology. So now I will talk about the project, I'm, like the part I'm working in this biorecover. So we engineer different protein known to bind metals. And for that, we work first with metallothionine, which is a protein uh, known to bind several metal. It's a small cysteine rich protein that can bind, for example, in this illustration, seven zinc, um, in this case, it has a really important uh, role in organism to protect the cells from uh, oxidative stress, DNA damage, and also protection against heavy metal uh, toxicity. So we are also working on further engineering and directed evolution on those protein. During this project, different assays were developed, the fast metal binding assay by indirect titration, also ICP assays with protein extract, and high throughput screening uh, with, for biological assay. So for this biological assay, it's based on metal toxicity uh, resistance. So for that, uh, as I explained earlier, metallothionine plays an important role for metal toxicity and also for protecting against oxidative stress. And the organism will produce the metallothionine that will bind the metals. And by doing this, will decrease the concentration of the metal in solution. So by using uh, a bacteria, for example, and introducing the, the protein collection that we have, if the protein cannot bind the metal, then the bacteria in high concentration of metal will be not able to grow. But if this protein is able to bind the metal by binding this metal, it will lower the concentration of the free metal in solution and the bacteria will be able to grow, multiply, and it will be a fastest way to screen which one would be the best candidate. So we start to have promising results and we are completing this, pro the, this work with more experiment and hope to publish soon the results. So during this biorecover project and also reading literature, and of course with the different presentation done earlier, you can see that many challenges appear during the metal biorecovery. First, you need to align with current parity of metal salt done by the metal refiner. And also it's challenging to work in a chemical environment that has different pH concentration of salt, and it can be multiple salt and organic compound that can interact. And also you need to be able to compete with the time scale of recovery. Can the biotechnology, biotechnology part can compete with the chemical methods. Then you need to be also uh, be able to pr 
have like an organism or protein that can selectively bind uh, a metal in the presence of other metals in solution and also other challenge to recover PGMs that is in really low concentration in aqueous solution. And the last challenge that we can mention is the recovery of PGM and gold from carbon in a recovery that should be more than 97%. So if you want to tackle those challenges and you think that you can help us with this uh, uh, metal bio recovery, we would be happy to talk more about that. So feel free to contact us. So I would like to thank my team at Johnson Mate and also the Bio Recover partners for the different uh, the the project and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Kalani. That that was really really interesting. Really interesting um, information about your involvement in the Bio Recover project and also the challenges that you've identified that you'd like some some support with. So thank you. So we've got a few uh, questions in the chat and. Um, Take a look at these. Are you able to stop sharing, Kalani? Oh, yeah, sorry. Thanks. Don't want anyone to miss my face. <laughs> it full screen. Um, yeah, so let's just kind of scroll back here and have a look. So, a couple of questions from Andrew Goddard. Um, Andrew, I'm not quite clear on, on what you're asking here. I don't know if you want to come off mute and, and pose the questions yourself or. Um, what organisms have here rare? Yeah, uh, I can do. Uh, oh, brilliant, Andrew, there, there. That's good. <laughs> yeah, do you want to just put your question? Yeah, the, the yeah. challenge, as far as I see, is if you do some simple back packet calculations on the amount of mel and the recovery. So let's say you, you look at PCBs, so boards, printed circuit boards, and ash them, and then look at the concentrations of metals, and then look at the price of the rare earth metal that you're trying to recover. And it don't make any sense to me economically. So there's no value in it. There doesn't seem to be any scope to make any money in it, just with a simple fag packet calculation. So um, if we if we look at gold, the people that recover gold and make money, then gold's obviously a lot more valuable. So it, you need something of the order of forty, you know, forty thousand pounds a kilo. So. To, to, to have, a re, have a process that works, you've got to have a very high value end product. The only end product I see from a rare earth metal that make money would be a nanoparticle. So if you could make a rare earth nanoparticle, then you're in the game. Otherwise, you're out of the game for me. I can't see how you make any money out of it. So, so really just a question about... So can somebody convince me, we're doing all this research, just, this is a simple fag packet calculation. If you just do the the amount of metal, and if you recovered it all, and it's worth this, there's no money in the process to to recover anything. There's no there's not enough value to get rid of the problem because you still got re residu residual waste that you've got to get rid of. So can some has anybody done these simple calculations to prove that this is doable? Any of the speakers, any comment on the sort of point where where things become economical, where the process becomes economical? I mean, I, I, I can I can have a go at that one if you if you want. I mean, Andrew, we, I mean, clearly we need, to, you know, I think the community work needs to work with, with people like yourselves that have got, you know, a handle on what the waste forms are and what the target should be. I mean, the, the point about making a high value product, I think is a good one. And, you know, you say we're doing all this research, but actually the rare earth stuff's really only just started. You know, there's really not a lot of work being done on it. And then the, there are several groups looking at that at the moment. Well, the, um, the only one that made sense on the fact packet calculation for me was uh, hard drives. They contain yeah. near the near uh, 20, 30 percent. So if you do the numbers, there's actually some money to be made if you can get the value of the recovery process to be less than 40, 45 pounds a ton. Yeah. And there's no, enough yeah. of it. So there's that, enough that, waste. So if you can yeah. do it for 45 a ton, you're in the game. If you can't, you're not in the game. And that's just yeah. gross. That's not, that's just gross. So it doesn't include asset, doesn't include. So that's that's your overall value paying for the asset back and the process yeah no sure so 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 
I guess there's an argument about making higher value products, which, which, he, which is- Hello, which is hello. I, I wonder if I would be allowed to pitch in on this. So we just, just I, let John respond to the point, Beatrice, and then- Sure. <laughs> yeah, so so I think one, one was higher value products, and, and that, that obviously clearly needs a lot more work to try to work out what you can make, you know? And then the other one, I guess, is, you know, do you just target one metal or are you looking at a process which is sorting and you know I you'll know the process is much better than I Andrew but can you do you really just try and target the rare earths or are you looking at a range of metals in the waste and you're trying to you know target those alongside gold or, or whatever you know so I, I I I mean my gut feeling would be you know people need to work with industry much closer with real waste well, today I would and look at it still, you know yeah, the, yeah, the yeah. value so, I mean, that's there in, in silver in a PCB bud. So you've now got a percentage, you've got two or three percent silver in a PCB bud. If you could turn that into a nano silver particle, then the overall economics started. There's a lot of copper, 20, 30 percent copper. So, so I think if you add them all up, you're starting to get there. But I, I, I um, think that's what I'm I think that's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> yeah. I mean, nobody I would just target the rare earth to look at everything. And, yeah, I think you've got to. But 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 I needed an option for the silver, so I'm very interested in what they were saying about nano silver. That would be oh, that would really push the economics that, in the right direction. That, that's very easy to reduce and precipitate, you know. So that 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 one is certainly doable at the moment. Is it? Well, yeah. you know, silver's worth a lot more, and if you could make it nano silver, you'd be even more. So, and it's there at two three percent, so it's a much more uh, tastier option for me. Okay, thank you. Beatrice, sorry, did you have something you wanted to Yeah, um, this is Beatriz Dominguez. I'm technical manager for biotechnology at Neon Somathi. I, I was wondering about the talks about metal earth because Kalani just presented. Yeah. I just wanted to make clear that what Kalani, what, what this project tries to recover is not rare earth, it's a platinum group metals, which intrinsically have very high value. Yes. And so Kalani, yes, please. Yeah. You go no, ahead. I just wanted to leave, <laughs> let John finish, and I wanted to add. Uh, so we, the bio recover project is on critical raw materials, but it's not just PGM; it's also raw earth elements. Uh, me as working for Johnson Matter, I'm working on the PGMS part, but we have other partners working on raw earth elements. So. I think they already have like good results on recovering those and it will be used later uh, to be to synthesize valuable project that you said is of course it's perhaps not like nanoparticles but it can be used it's valuable we have people who calculate everything and that's why we are working on that I hope I answered to the question yeah, thanks Kalani thank you um, I think we have one for Lee now. Um, when DRAM removes a mixture of metals um, from circuit boards, um, can these metals be separated and recovered? Or how can these metals be separated and recovered? Are you there, Lee? Sorry. Oh, <laughs> Um, simply yes, um, it can be done by a, a variety of methods. So you can use chemical or biological usually. Um, the way we tend to do it, because we have a lot of the DRAM filters, um, we just go for the cheapest method, essentially. So it can then be, and then we can then reuse more DRAM to treat the effluent. So that ultimately what you're left with is you can have either sequential recovery of the metals and clean water, or you have a very small amount of spent drum that needs to be disposed of if there's nothing worth recovering from it. If, as in a lot of cases, the residuals that are left are nitrogen rich or even phosphorus rich, then quite often the residual filter can be simply converted into fertilizer or soil amendments. So, so yes, um, that's all possible. Thanks, Lee. I'm scrolling through here now. Um, there's a question here. I'm not sure if it's um, targeted at specific, specifically one of the speakers, but um, Maria Sotenko has asked, um, do you develop strategies to desorb metals from proteins? Um, 
it could be me because I talk about protein. Towards, yeah, yeah. yeah. So yes, we are also thinking about how to dissolve and we actually know how to do it with those proteins. So yes, we are working on dissolving and then it will be helping the other partners to use the release methods. Thanks, Joanna. Just, I think I've picked up on all the questions in the chat there. Does anybody else have anything, any other questions for the, the speakers? I have one, um, one for Kala, Kalani and um, I think also Virginia mentioned uh, use of engineering biology as an approach. And I just wanted to know um, what can be done to um, speed up the uptake of engineering biology and what do you think are the barriers at the moment to use more of engineering biology for the process? So is it in, you know, missing technologies to engineer the microbes you are using? Do we need to find and identify new microbes? Um, so we have partners working on metagenomics. So they already know, for example, which microorganism to use uh, for bioleaching and everything. For my part, what uh, start to be quite difficult is even if I engineer my proteins and I have solubility issues, for example, or uh, because I'm using it inside uh, a bacteria, actually the bacteria has its own uh, way to protect itself. So I always need to compare with the bacteria without expressing the, the engineered protein. So sometimes I have just the bacteria by itself resisting to the, the metal toxicity. So sometimes I need to use a really high amount of uh, PGMS, which I should not, uh, I mean, I just need like a good affinity. So the affinity part is like something I will do after, but I would say, I don't know if I answered the question. It's like, I think for different projects, the different part of the biorecover is uh, different for the engineering process. Okay. Um, Virginia, do you have anything to add? In, in our case, uh, some of the species we use are non model organisms. So currently, there are no uh, many tools to engineer them. So in, in the case of Morganella cyclotolerance and the sulfobibrial ascensis, they are uh, naturally resistant to metals and what we want to, and they also produce mm. the nanoparticles. So with them, and by engineering them, we want to harness uh, their natural ability. And um, so uh, in terms of uh, the, um, so do, did you want to know a bit more about the, the challenges? Uh, so yeah, just to understand the challenges and what maybe mm -hmm. can be done more. Do we need a you know, different set of tools because they are unusual microbes? They're not the usual you know, standard lab microorganisms normally. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, depending on the, on the metals, uh, uh, different organisms will be more suitable than, than others. Uh, we, we use also proteomics to identify um, the, prote the, 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 the mechanisms responsible for uh, metal resistance. And uh, in terms of, so uh, speeding up, like uh, sometimes uh, some uh, bacteria will take uh, longer to grow and um, so I I believe that uh, I don't think I don't know if I'm answering the. Well, that, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think yeah, no, that that's good. Um, if anyone else uh, 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 would like to to uh, answer to have to answer this this question more accurately, more. No, I think we can pick it up maybe in the breakout rooms in the, in hmm. the moment. Um, there are some raised hands. Maybe I just go through the list. Um, Kenneth. Do you want to unmute yourself? And um... thank you, <clears throat> Kenneth from the Scotch Whisky Research Institute. I was just interested with the, uh, the organisms or the microbial side of recovering metals. I was just wanting to know or understand how robust they are, you know, to environmental conditions like P uh, pH, heat, or even uh, particle size. And, and essentially, what are the limiting factors uh, that will determine how successful the organisms are at recovering 
uh, metals. It's, I understand it's obviously there is a, a specific factor for I guess involved in there, but just more generally, uh, you know what 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 they like with these factors. Should I, should I start with that one? Go ahead, yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a really good question. And I think a lot of the model organisms we talked about today are, are probably some of the, 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 the less exotic ones, you know, so they're, they're typically ones from lab culture collections that grow quite happily around circumnutrient pH and ambient temperatures. And sometimes they can be useful in more extreme conditions, particularly if you pre-grow the biomass and you don't need all the cell activity you know you might just need target enzymes um, but I think it does you know there, there are clearly limits but when you look at the the limits to life you know you, you, you're down below zero or or up at 121 degrees C you've got pressures you know resistance to metals you know all, all sorts of conditions that microbes can tolerate so I think that kind of a, goes to the other the point earlier on you know, do you want to engineer everything or do you actually sometimes want to go out and source organisms and consortia that can survive in those extreme environments? And biomining is a classic example, you know, that that's been done for, for decades using acidophiles that are adapted to growth at pH one or two. So I, I think it, you know, look at what, what the process is and, and what you need out of it. And then if you can't use existing organisms, I think there's a, there's a lot of bioprospecting that could be done as well. And sometimes you want actually a consortium, a nice stable consortium, rather than a, you know, a highly engineered organism. I mean, a, a lot of us are interested in both options, but I think it depends on what the, you know, what what the the the, the challenge is, what you're trying to treat. Thanks, John. I don't know if anyone other speaker would like to drop in. Otherwise, David has his hand raised. No, Sorry. David, yeah. go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to um, show you a different a version of the periodic table, which elaborates on some of these things and sort of presents the problem. But I think you have some other specific questions, which maybe you should take first. Is that there was one came in the chat just a moment ago? Then I can do that afterwards. Tim, do you have the question which came in the chat? Um, yeah, from George. I'll ask a question for Lee here. Um, would drum technology be effective for removing heavy metals from gypsum? gypsum sourced from neutralizing acid from copper mining. Um, is this the gypsum sludge from when they've uh, precipitated out the iron? George, I don't know if you want to come off mute. And... Yeah, um, yeah the, the, the gypsum is sourced from um, um, the copper mining process, they, they're using, I guess, what, magnesium and sulfate and calcium carbonate to neutralize the sulfuric acid, I think. Um, yeah. But the, that gypsum is not popular in the agricultural industry because of heavy metal contamination. Um, so is your technology suitable for removing those heavy metals and can it do it at a cost that makes this thing, makes it a viable proposition? Simple answer is I don't know. We haven't tried, but theoretically, yeah, it should be. But it would be similar to the um, the the uh, circuit board method that we use. So the you would have to solubilize the metals that were on the gypsum, and then we could treat them and recover them from the dram. You couldn't just apply the dram to the gypsum. Right. 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 Well, um, perhaps I can just send you a bit of information and we can just take up a Perfect. discussion. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks, George. <clears throat> David, did you want to make your point? Yes. Can I just share my screen? Would that be okay? Sure. I just wanted to show you a, a new version of the periodic table, well, not extremely new, but fairly new, which we developed to try and elaborate on what we're talking about here in this meeting. Uh, can you see my screen now? Yeah. Yeah, so this is a, a version of the periodic table, which is actually not quite the data you're looking at. You're looking at um, uh, critical minerals where the supply chain is important. Here we're looking specifically at the supply, at the availability of the elements. And so what we've done is we've taken the periodic table and we've made the area covered by each element uh, proportional to its concentration in the Earth's crust and in the atmosphere. 
Uh, so lots of oxygen, lots of silicon, not much of these ones down here. It's a logarithmic scale, otherwise you wouldn't see these things down here. We then colored the elements in a way that tells us what we're doing with them. So if we're uh, taking a mobile phone and then when we don't use it anymore, sticking it in a drawer, that the elements in that phone are dispersed. So we're seeing how long it will take us to disperse uh, these elements in such a way that they'll not be readily available to us. And so uh, there's a serious threat in 100 years for these red ones, a rising threat from the orange ones. And in fact, we've now changed lithium to orange uh, for the reasons that were described earlier. Uh, and then some of these other ones, limited availability. The green ones on the whole are readily available or recycled in nature. You'll see there are four here which come uh, minerals that can come from conflict areas. They don't have to because in each case there are other mines. This is tantalum, tungsten, gold and tin. And then we put a phone symbol on 31 of these elements, which are the 31 elements in most, uh, in most phones. And so this is a, a way of representing the data, which is slightly different from what we have. And you can look at this and you say, okay. And then you look and you see, you've talked a lot about rare earth elements. And you see, we haven't really identified them as being a problem. The reason for this is that there was a very big find of rare earth elements off the coast of Japan in the sea in 2018, and that probably has enough in it for us for a very long time, although probably it's not being mined yet. The one that we have here, dysprosium in orange, is because it's used in the uh, magnets and windmills, and that, that will take a large demand on dysprosium. So I thought you might be interested to see that as a representation if you haven't seen it before. And we do have another version, which, uh, is that not the other version, sorry. That's the other version, where we've uh, color coded it now to show recycling. Now this data is actually rather old, but you'll see that many of the elements which we're worried about are hardly recycled at all. That's the pink ones. So um, some of the elements you talked about, platinum group metals, of course, are heavily recycled. And that's uh, what Johnson Matthews have done for many years. So there's not a problem with them. And cobalt itself is recycled quite a lot. But indium, which is a, a critical element in the uh, using indium tin oxide in phones and so on, that's not recycled at all. Tantalum using microcapacitors, which is also can be a conflict mineral, that's also not recycled at all. So uh, I thought you might be interested in these two representations of the data, although, as I say, slightly different data. Thank you. Thanks, David. It's pretty really interesting to see these other visualizations of, of um, illustrates, I guess, the volumes of, of the different uh, elements and things is really, really good. I don't know if any of the speakers want to respond to. I, I just wanted to thank David for sharing that. And I, I couldn't see the second one. I, I don't know if that was just me. Did you not? Oh, sorry, let's try again. Ah, okay. Yeah, I see that now. Yeah, no? Okay, so it's basically the same picture, although it's, it doesn't have the carbon with the multicolor because this is an older version. Um, oh. Right here, that's not that one shape. Right. And so what we've done here is we've, we've the same colors, but we then color coded underneath with a second color. And this is based on the recycling. Yeah, I'll just give you a better pointer, hang on. Right, so here are the colors down here, which represent how much is recycled. And you'll see that the compounds like tantalum, which is used in microcapacities in every phone, uh, the indium, which is used in the touch screen, lithium, hardly recycled at all at the moment, although I was good, glad to see that you're working on that. That's a very, very important, I think, in the future, because with recycling, we have enough lithium. Without recycling, we don't. As I say, we change this to orange because we think there is a, a danger in, in the not too distant future. But you see the platinum group metals down here. These are being recycled by Johnson Matthew. Cobalt being recycled, zinc being recycled. Some of these, it's interesting that zinc is in red here because it only has about uh, 20 to 50 years left on the current mines that are available. So uh, does that, does that help? Thanks David, yeah, that, that's great. Um, sorry to cut you short there, but we just we promised a, a breakout session as part of today's um, oh, agenda. Right. So we're, we're, we're rapidly running out of time here. Sorry, I do uh, beg your pardon. No, I, but thank I, you. That was really I, useful. I it. Yeah. So yeah, so we have um, Biotech Innovators launch on Thursday, the 6th of October, as I mentioned, and then on the 24th of November, um, 
an event looking at biomass to chemicals, a report that Catherine Mort from KTN has produced um, for Bayes, We're looking at that report, and then the biorefinery concept. A registration for that will open soon. Um, and yes, as I said, these are our contact details. So um, please reach out if you have any questions or you'd like to be introduced to anybody that, um, that spoke today. Um, all that remains now is to thank you all for coming along, to thank all of our speakers for the fantastic contribution. Um, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. <laughs>